Before I talk about the actual memorial here, it's going to be very technical early on, just so I don't end up using any terms you don't understand. Um, I mean, I'll use the word Nazi a lot, of course, as well, but I'll also sometimes use National Socialist or NS regime as well. Nazi was actually, uh, we're not entirely sure, but it was most likely American soldiers who actually came up with it. It's a shortened version of National Socialist. And that's actually a shortened version of the Nazi Party's official name, which was the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Um, but National Socialists was a reflection of their ideology. They were very populist, they, you know, nationalists, and they wanted a strong and powerful Germany. But socialists, and they wanted to supposedly, you know, look after the poorest in society, redistribution of wealth, social welfare systems and stuff like that um, as well. And in, in, S, in, in German, they don't actually refer to them Nazi, as Nazis that often. It's kind of more, uh, you know, an English uh, term. It's usually the National Socialist or the NS regime, it's shortened to. The other one, as you saw on our tour, I mean, it's, we also refer to this, and, excuse my terrible Irish accent, the Third Reich Tour mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, this will come up quite a few times because we try and go right back into like the origins of the Nazi party. How did they manage to come to power um, in the manner they did? And a big part of it was this feeling that um, after World War I, that Germany had been humiliated, that it had been weakened, and that the Nazis were promising the German people that they would restore Germany's glory was the idea. And this is where Hitler came up with this idea of referring to the empire he hoped to establish as the Third Reich. The idea being, of course, that there was two big ones gone before them. The oldest one in the Middle Ages was Charlemagne in 800 AD. He was a crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And the idea was he was crowned by the Pope to continue like the Roman Empire onwards. But, you know, in reality, it was based roughly where Germany is today. Uh, so mod it incorporated modern Germany, Austria, parts of France, Eastern Europe, Poland, Czech Republic, and that as well. But that was considered the first glory period in German history. So that's the first strike. The second one then is a bit more modern. Um, after the, the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire, and that, well, for a long time it wasn't even the proper empire, it was a loose confederation of different countries, um, and that ruled by basically the King of Austria. That, that, that collapses at the end of the First World War, and then in 1871, Germany is properly unified for the first time into the German Empire, um, led by people like Otto von Bismarck, the German Chancellor. Um, they have an emperor, and, that, and that's considered this other next glory period in German history, uh, when Germany considered itself a world power. Uh, that collapses at the end of World War I with the abdication um, of the emperor of Kaiser Wilhelm II. He flees to the Netherlands, where he dies in 1943. Um, so the idea was Hitler was going to restore these glorious periods with his new empire, and that this would be the third line um, in long history, hence the expression the Third Reich, uh, which he comes up with um, as well. But getting on to the actual uh, uh, stop here, um, we're right into the middle of it uh, because we're, we're our first stop here is heading in towards the former Jewish quarter um, in Berlin. Berlin's Jewish community moved here after the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century, so obviously 1618, Thirty Years' War until 1648. Berlin had been massively depopulated, but Berlin has lost about half of its population. So to repopulate the city, they invited all sorts of groups here. Um, French Protestants, Huguenots um, moved here. Um, There's Protestants from Eastern Europe and Czech Republic and that. But also Jewish community were actively welcomed here as well. And by the time the Nazis came to power in 1933, Germany's Jewish population was still relatively small. It was only about 0.6% of the population in total. But about two thirds of those were here in Berlin. Um, so about whatever, 400,000 Jewish people here in Berlin. So the, the vast majority of Jewish people were here in Berlin as well. Now by 1943, um, that number has shrunk to just 17,000 Jewish people left in Berlin. The majority, of course, fled the country or deported to the camps at this point. The remaining groups um, are either, you know, important people that they don't want to deport because they're doctors or engineers or whatever people they need to keep um, at work. Um, they're veterans of the First World War as well. So, you know, honored people who gained medals fighting for Germany in the First World War. Um, they're children of mixed marriages, so they're children with parent, one non-Jewish -Jew parent and a Jewish parent, and they're um, uh, Jewish men married to non-Jewish women um, as well. It's, it's a weird sort of thing that um, uh, by that point, um, Jewish women married to non-Jewish men, um, they'd either been deported already at that point, or in fact, many of the men um, uh, um, got divorces from their Jewish wives, and so non-Jewish men actually divorced their Jewish wives as well. But Jewish women were more targeted um, in mixed marriages than that, um, because there's, <laughs> under um, you know Jewish tradition and that, it's considered that only women um, carry on Jewish heritage. 1943, this is also around the time the war is going badly with the defeat at Stalingrad and that um, Hitler wants to make Berlin Jew-free is the idea. So these remaining 17,000 Jews are to be deported um, from Berlin. Um, 
Now, of the 17,000, they would have been, uh, after, as they were picked up from their homes and their places of work, they would have been brought to different assembly points, most of them former Jewish community centers and that. But the actual um, men in mixed marriages and the children of mixed marriages were broken off from the rest of the group, and they were actually brought to this location here at Rosenstrasse now. It, it's gone. At the end of World War II, this site was very heavily bombed, and then with the communists rebuilding East Berlin, they completely built around here. You can see this is all very modern architecture. The only thing that's really original is the parts of the facade of the building here at the ground floor and you can actually see above the gate here there is some remaining bullet and shrapnel damage but we'll see some more impressive examples of that um, as we, we go to some of the different stops as well here in the former Jewish quarter and that but um, about 7,000 of them were being held here in some buildings in this area and here but uh, there was actually a, a protest about 2,000 of their family members particularly their wives and their children actually started protesting outside the building here at the assembly point over two weeks and the amazing thing is at the height of Nazi power this is 1943 this isn't shortly after Nazis come to power they're at the height of their power at this point they're actually successful um, after the two weeks um, their men were released although many of them had to remain as forced laborers in Berlin but they were allowed to remain in Berlin with their families and about uh, 25 to 30 of them were actually brought back from Auschwitz they'd already been deported to uh, Auschwitz and they were brought back here and released as well um, this this is you know it's a major uprising against the Nazis here in the very heart of Berlin unfortunately um, we're still in former East Berlin uh, the part that was run by the communists and that will come up for a bit a couple of times at different memorials because it meant this uprising was overlooked. Um, East Germany used the experience of National Socialism to justify their state ideology, their kind of national mythos, um, and that things like, you know, that, uh, you know, we didn't cooperate with the Nazis, that East Germans didn't cooperate with the Nazis, they were victims of National Socialism, that, and also this ideology that, you know, communism would assure that what happened to the Nazis would never happen again. And it was also a way to beat the West, that this idea that capitalism like existed in the West and America and that was just a, a one step away from being fascism as well. But under Nazi uh, under East German ideology, even though they you know, were trying to say that they're better than the Nazis and they wouldn't allow what the Nazis did to happen again to homosexuals and Jews and groups like that, they still overlooked many of these groups in favor of emphasizing communist and anti-fascist fighters who were victims of National Socialism as well. So the first memorial to memorials to Jewish people in East Berlin is only built in 1987, or at least placed in East Berlin in 1987, very shortly before the Berlin Wall um, falls. This memorial, I know it looks kind of old, but it's because it's sitting under the trees, was only based, put here in 1995, um, designed by an East German sculptor, a woman called um, uh, uh, Hunsinger, um, and it's called the Women's Block, and you can clearly see where that comes from. On the left, you have the women protesting along with children, and on the right is their men bound up and then breaking free. There's a few other smaller press and more, like you can see, and um, the bench over here with the man sitting on it. Now, for a while, I thought there was two possible interpretations to this. One, that it was a small act of resistance. So while this is a big act of resistance against the Nazis, this is a small act of resistance. This will come up when we're in front of the new synagogue as well, that when the Nazis came to power in 1933, it wasn't just immediately discriminatory laws and sending people to the camps. It was progressive discriminatory laws, um, starting with little things, like they couldn't have pets. They couldn't hire um, German... Um, German house staff, so they couldn't hire German maids or cleaning staff or butlers and stuff like that to work in their households. And in fact, there was, they weren't allowed to sit in public park benches. In a few cases, there were special benches for them, painted yellow with stars of David's on them and that. So you could look at this and think this is a Jewish man sitting on a public park bench, it's a small act of resistance. But I was proven wrong when the actual sculpture herself in an interview said that the intention of this park bench over here was that it's a genteel, it's a non-Jewish person looking on passively as this is taking place here um, at Rosenstein. So it's quite critical and quite biting of the local community who didn't really become involved with this vigil here, didn't up, uh, rise up to show solidarity um, with Jewish people when they were being um, deported. There's also quite a bit of you know Jewish symbolism on it. I don't get all of it. Um, the one I do know um, on the right here, you get the two hands. Um, which is uh, what the, the rabbi does at like in the ceremonies to bless the people um, in the synagogue, and that um, and you might recognise as well it inspired Spock hands as well, uh, Leonard, uh, Leonard, Leonard Nimoy, um, and that's up Spock hands. Um, guys, do take a few minutes, walk around the memorial, take a few pictures, ask me a few questions if you have any, and that, and then we'll hop on the bicycles and head on to our next stop.